Good afternoon, and welcome to PEG TV and Catamount Radio's broadcast with more information about, well, what's going on with COVID-19. And uh, our guests today on PEG TV and WSYB AM 1380 and uh, FM 100.1, Dr. Mel Boyton, Chief Medical Officer at RRMC, and our friend Claudio. Uh, Claudio, you know, you are the CEO and President of Rutland Regional Medical Center, and uh, you're back again. This is like, is it the third or fourth time that we've done this now? Have lost count. Uh, Peg's saying it's the fourth time, Terry. Fourth time? Yeah. Okay. Well, we're back again, and before we go any further, I just want to thank the incredible callers that made the last show go by like that. You guys were amazing, respectful, they were great questions, and we learned a lot. So if you guys are ready, let's start with the first question of the day. We're still in this, in, we're still in this situation, obviously. Increased hand sanitizing, social distancing, we're still doing that, and we're still wearing the masks, as you can see. However, the governor is gradually opening things up and regulations around this state are being relaxed a little bit. Uh, how does that affect our healthcare services with the relaxing of the rules going to the next stage? Yeah, so um, we uh, actually last Friday, we started uh, resuming doing elective surgical procedures. Dr. Boynton can talk to you a little bit further about that. Um, but we started doing that and we started seeing more inpatient visits in our medical clinics. So we've really started reopening up the hospital and starting to get back to take care of patients who have put off their health care for a couple of months. And uh, um, so we're starting to uh, ramp back up. You know, the last thing that you guys want is for somebody to put off something that you know, say they had a bad hip or they needed that knee replacement. Uh, obviously, you don't want any patients to be walking around in pain or suffering, so you want to get to that stuff. Uh, what about um, these elective surgeries? What are you seeing uh, the most of? What, what are they trying to do? What are they going for first? I'll defer to Dr. Boynton on that. So at this stage, um, Terry, I'm going to move a little bit away. It's supposed to be six feet here. Um, the, uh, at this stage, uh, we're doing outpatient surgery only. So um, mostly, athletic, mostly athletes um, who have had injuries, um, people who have uh, put off things like hernias, uh, um, other elective things that could wait, um, but we'll be sure that they get home the same day. Okay. Um, what about going in to visit the clinics and hospitals in person versus, say, telepractice? So you're going to see uh, when you come into the hospital a whole host. If you haven't been in the hospital for the past couple of months um, and you put off your test or your procedure or your visit, uh, you're going to see things look uh, quite a bit different. Uh, first of all, you're going to be greeted at the door by a clinician who will do some screening on you, who will take your temperature, ask if you're feeling well, ask if you have any symptoms or signs that might be consistent with COVID. So we're going to screen you before you come in. We're going to, if you're not wearing a mask, although you should be when we're out in public, we should be wearing our masks per the governor's recommendations and the commissioner of health's recommendations. If by chance you forgot your mask that morning, we're going to give you a mask to wear when you're in the hospital or in the clinic at all times. Uh, and then when you go see your physician uh, and or your clinician, you're going to see that all of our staff are wearing masks at all times. Um, so there's a whole host of things that you will be able to see visibly that will look differently. You'll see in the waiting rooms, we've spaced out your chairs. Uh, so we're not having a full waiting room anywhere in the hospital or our clinics. Uh, so we can uh, do that. And you might be asked uh, if you feel more comfortable to wait in your car 
and we will either call you on your cell phone or we'll come out and get you when we're when the physician is ready or your test or procedure is ready. So there's going to be some things that are going to look quite a bit different and then there's going to be a whole host of things that are, we're doing behind the scenes that you're not that are not going to be readily apparent um, but uh, that are there to protect you. So for example the clinic waiting room and the um, your exam room in the clinic, uh, when you leave, that's going to be thoroughly disinfected and cleaned. Um, we do some of that anyway regularly, but we're, we are now doing a very thorough cleaning in between patients so that uh, you can be safe and the next patient following you can be safe. Yeah, I, I know that there are a lot of people that don't like going in for the colonoscopy, don't like going <coughs> in for the mammogram. Uh, these routine uh, diagnostic imaging procedures um, it's the same thing with these folks. I mean, obviously, they're worried about their own safety, and at the same time, they need to get these procedures done. Uh, so they should feel comfortable in that atmosphere. Yes, um, Terry, that's a great point. Um, we've done a lot of things to make things safe. The entire healthcare uh, industry is doing a great job to make things safe. It's really not a time to put off important screening procedures. Um, or important physician visits um, at all. Um, when you come to the clinic, you're going to be asked if whether or not you have any symptoms. Uh, myself and our employees and our staff are all asked the same questions on the way in to um, work every morning. Um, the important thing is keeping people with even mild symptoms um, away from those of us who don't have any symptoms um, in order to bring this virus uh, pandemic to an end. You know, there are uh, people that are walking down the street and posting on Facebook, happy days are here again because the warmer weather is here. And uh, so you're saying social distancing and wearing the mask is still the right thing to do. Absolutely. I mean, happy days are here. It's sunny out today. We've had uh, a long winter. Um, um, but at the same time, we can enjoy that, um, wearing a mask, keeping six feet away, focusing on hand hygiene, cough hygiene, um, paying attention to even mild symptoms. When I'm in the waiting room, or if I uh, have to say I have to have a stay at the hospital, you know, that's even before this happened, people said, well, you know, you want to get people in and out of the hospital is quickly as possible. And of course, you know, uh, whether it's elective surgery or emergency surgery, that's always weighing on their minds. There's a lot of anxiety there if I had to have that hospital stay. And, and you guys are prepared to make sure that our, our patients are safe. Um, absolutely. Um, you gotta understand, as a, as a percentage of the hospitalization, less than 10%, we've never had a time where more than 10% of our patients were COVID positive um, or had COVID symptoms. So we've been very fortunate. Um, I attribute that to the incredible um, response uh, to our governor's order of our citizens. Um, but so the hospital in general has been quite safe all the way through. We have distinct units. So if you have COVID-like symptoms or flu-like illness, um, you're in a, a safe environment away from patients who don't have those types of symptoms. So it's very important to us that it, with our staff and with the patients that we don't have cross-reaction um, or, or cross-interaction um, with patients um, that uh, don't have flu-like illness symptoms. And, and I think to add what the, Dr. Boynton was saying is we know how to do this at the hospital. Uh, we've been doing this. This is not new to us. Infection control procedures and dealing with people with infectious diseases and keeping people and our staff safe is nothing new to our hospital or pretty much any hospital in the country. This is what we do every day and we've been doing it for years and decades. What was new to us during this COVID pandemic is we did not expect, nor were we prepared, uh, to take care of potentially up to 30 or 40 highly infectious people on ventilators. 
Um, that was the big thing for our hospital at Rutland Regional, trying to prepare to take care of, of a huge surge of people. That didn't materialize because of all the work uh, that the governor did and the state of Vermont and Vermonters did to be take this seriously and follow the instructions of the Department of Health and social distance and stay home. Um, and fortunately, we don't have those patients in the hospital, nor did we see that. At our peak at Rutland Regional, we had five COVID positive patients in the hospital. And now we have, I think, one today. So, and we just had a very successful discharge of a patient who was in with us in ICU on a respirator for three weeks and in the hospital for almost six weeks, I think. So for a long time. So, but you know, we, we got this and you can be assured when you come to the hospital, we are taking precautions um, to protect you and to make sure if we do have any infectious patients that they're isolated and taken care of appropriately. Let's talk about Vermont's response for a second, because you both mentioned that. I've had some people, friends of mine from out of state say, well, you're in Vermont, you're tucked away in the middle of nowhere, you weren't exposed to it. And my answer always was, have you ever heard of Killington? I mean, we, we live in a great resort area. We had thousands of people from all over New England and beyond so you think it was a, a, a great response that Vermont had? Yes, this was not just because we're up tucked in Vermont. Um, we have, this was ski season. You had a lot of people from all over the country and all over the world at Killington. Um, you were on the border of New York State and Massachusetts and some very, you know, we're five hours away from New York City. So there's a lot of, um, there's a lot more action and cross-pollination than people realize. It is because we were very proactive in practicing social distancing. And that's still, that threat is still out there. Um, if we don't do this and re-enter gradually and do it smartly and follow the guidelines, uh, we still could be out there. So we haven't, you know, none of this stuff has gone away. This is actually, at Rutland Regional, this is our new normal. And all the work we've done, Dr. Boynton and myself and the whole clinical team and administrative team has been working on how do we operate over the next 18 months, give or take, under this new normal. I'm Terry J from uh, Catamount Radio. You're listening to WSYB and uh, 100.1 FM, and we're on PEG TV live today. And uh, we have uh, Chief uh, Medical Officer uh, Mel Boynton, Dr. Mel Boynton here, and also uh, CEO and President Claudio Fort. We're uh, giving you guys more information that, uh, that we want and that we need. And I thank PEG TV for this great opportunity and cooperation today. If we can get back to elective surgeries, are they stacked up? I mean, if I had a surgery scheduled for uh, March uh, 16th, uh, where am I now? And am I, am I, it's like planes at O'Hare waiting to take off. Uh, how, how backed up are we or, or are we? So we, we are backed up. Um, on the other hand, um, we're taking a very deliberate, thoughtful approach. And um, so what we did was rather than take people that were at the beginning of the line, the plane ready to take off but can't take off because of the weather, move them to the back of the line, we moved the entire um, group of patients as they were scheduled and moved back. Um, that being said, as we've had to um, adjust what patients are safe to take care of right now versus patients that we feel like we still need to wait a little bit on um, and let the pandemic play out and the curve flatten a bit more. Um, there has been some reshuffling of uh, um, younger, healthier patients um, as opposed to patients that are not quite as healthy um, early on. You hear people talking about, you mentioned younger patients. Have you guys, I know you're aware of it, uh, have you had any cases of children with this uh, rash and uh, this uh, kind of a offshoot of COVID-19 that people are talking about that we see in the news? I don't think so, have we? Have, no. that been... we well, we have not had any pediatric admissions um, of COVID-19. So I actually wouldn't be able to tell you, you know, if there's even been a positive 
uh, COVID-19 uh, test in a child yeah. um, as yet. That would have gone through pediatricians. Well, I, I, no I, one's I, needed to be admitted, so wonderful. That's great news. Yeah. Uh, we talked about um, wait times and hospital stays. What about going to the hospital to visit grandma? We all want to come in. We all want to bring uh, flowers and candy and uh, it's her birthday and she's in the hospital and we all want to be with her. What, what, what do we do? Yeah, those, uh, unfortunately, one of the things that we're going to have to realize in the new normal is, um, again, for the protection of our patients and our staff, um, we are still going to have the visitor restrictions in place where you can only have an essential support person come with you. The whole family is not going to be, unfortunately, able to come and see Grandma for her protection and for everybody's. Uh, we are working on having some, making sure that you can call Grandma and that uh, we are working on getting some video links so that you can get an iPad and you can, you can still see Grandma, you just can't come to the room. Uh, the other thing also is really important, though, is if, unfortunately, Grandma is not doing well, um, and I think one of the fears and one of the tragedies we've seen worldwide has been people dying alone of COVID. Um, uh, Dr. Boynton and the clinical staff and the medical staff will make arrangements so that you can be with your loved one um, and we can relax some of those visitor restrictions. It depends upon the clinical situation. It's gonna be a case by case thing, but pretty much um, if you go in the hospital and things don't look well or so forth, um, you will be able to come and be with your loved, person, your loved one and, and your family or friends if, if that happens. Um, but again, routine visits, we're restricting it to one person um, because again, we're still gonna be living under this for quite a while and we wanna make sure that we're not inadvertently exposing more people or spreading this to our patients or our staff. I have a friend who uh, works at a hospital in Queens and he said that uh, his mom was in the hospital that he worked at, but he was unable to go in and see her. But he knew the nurse that was there. And uh, again, a shout out to the nurses. Um, that nurse spent every minute, every last moment of his mom's life with her. And uh, he said, just a shout out to all the people that are out there and all the first responders. It's, they, you guys do an amazing job. You really do. So thank you to everybody that is spending those last moments with people. Uh, it, it's, it's amazing. So thank you for that. Uh, I did an ad for Spartan Arena uh, a few weeks ago. What happened to the Spartan Arena alternate care site? Uh, what is going on with that? So it is still there and it is still staged up. Uh, we're looking at, we're working with the state of Vermont, the governor's office, the Agency of Human Services and Vermont Emergency Preparedness. So this whole Spartan Arena, Arena project was in conjunction with them. We're gonna keep it staged up for a period of time longer. We think probably through the end of May. We don't anticipate we're going to need that, and I think um, some of the other sites throughout the state that were staged or run by the National Guard are looking at or they're planning to decommission those because fortunately we haven't needed that surge site. So the Spartan Arena, I think we're going to keep it in place through the end of May, um, work with the states, and hopefully we don't need this. I think we want to still have that staged up as we start reopening things in the state. Uh, just in case, since we spent so much time and effort to, to get that staged up. We also have another site in Menden that we're um, leasing from uh, Killington and uh, great uh, uh, cooperation and support from Killington uh, um, Resort and, and Mike Salomano, their president, who um, this was a site in Menden that they used for employee housing there. And as they shut down the operation, they didn't need that. So they leased it to us and we've uh, staged that up to be a 40 bed unit for COVID positive patients that can't go home, either because they don't have a home or because they have someone compromised at their home, they can recover in this uh, setting. We haven't had to use that either. That we might end up keeping ramped up a little bit longer than Spartan Arena. But again, we're doing this both in, all, both these projects are in conjunction with the state. Dr. Boynton, uh, 
do you think Vermont will continue to flatten the curve? I mean, we've done a great job. We talked about that. We've done an incredible job. Um, yes, I do think so. Um, I would also just anticipate that we are going to see blips, that we're going to see uh, small infections and small outbursts uh, of this infection um, occur in, on an occasional basis. Um, it may be a big outburst or it may be small. Um, it doesn't take a lot to, uh, to start this virus back up. Um, on the other hand, um, if we follow the science, which our governor and our commissioner of health have done a great job of doing, we'll continue to mitigate this and keep it nice and low um, and uh, prevent unnecessary illness. You know, uh, you mentioned the coming months, and there's probably going to be these blips, and we mentioned the weather, uh, how beautiful it is out there today. Next week, it's supposed to be in the 70s. It's just really hard to go outside wearing your shorts and your sandals and a mask when it's 78 degrees. Do you think we're going to be able to hold ourselves back? I mean, it's a lot of self-discipline. Well, you know, when I go out in shorts and sandals and it's 78 degrees and I'm by myself, you know, working in the yard or work, cooking uh, on the grill or what have you, um, I'm not going to have my mask on. But when I am with a group of friends or I'm at work or there's any opportunity for me to cough or my talking to result in droplets getting close to uh, friends and relatives, I'm going to do the right thing. I will have the mask on. Okay. Um, but I think, you know, it's, uh, if you want to go for a hike in the woods, if you want to um, maintain a significant distance from others, um, you can be outside without a mask on. Yeah, there, there are all kinds of activities that you could do with others without being next to each other. You can go kayaking or golfing or playing tennis on opposite sides of the net. Uh, so we do have opportunities to Absolutely. be together and separate at the same time. And take advantage of those. It's nice to get a deep breath every <laughs> once in a while. <laughs> uh, how else uh, will the hospital respond if, heaven forbid, we do get a blip, and what if that blip turns into a surge? Are, are you guys going to be ready for that? You know, as Claudio mentioned, um, we will be ready. We're ready now. Um, we were not ready for the predicted surge um, that may have occurred back in March um, or in April if Vermonters hadn't done the right thing and uh, um, stayed away from each other and gave the virus a chance to work its way out of the system. But we are ready now. Um, and uh, um, we have what we call negative pressure rooms, or pressure rooms that have the appropriate air handling. So if somebody does have an infection, we have a safe place to keep them that's not going to expose others in the hospital. Um, we've got the PPE, or the personal, personal protective equipment, that's necessary to uh, care for individuals with highly contagious diseases. Um, we have the screening procedures in place. Um, We've got the medications we need. The, the surge, um, if it, even if it's an overwhelming surge, we have the communication systems in place now with the other hospitals in Vermont and uh, our other tertiary partners um, to manage that. So it's a, it's a much different situation going forward than it would have been. I think it's, um, it would be unlikely that we would get to what we call crisis care. It's, uh, um, we are prepared for taking care of patients, even an a outbreak, um, in a very effective um, and nearly routine manner, unlike where we were six, eight weeks ago. Our average listeners and viewers today, what can they do? Is there any, I mean, we, I, I talked to a woman yesterday, she's made nearly 700 face masks and donated them to people. And if you want to give a donation, I think she gives it to the nurses or Humane Society or buys food for uh, first responders. Uh, you guys are okay with masks? You guys are okay with PPE? All that stuff? 
Right now we are. Right now we're in great shape with yeah. all of that. The, the, what they call the supply chain is still a bit fragile. It's not a time to waste these resources. The, the masks are relatively precious, um, but the, we can use them as a routine and we don't feel like we're in a, a crisis mode at all. Um, there are new sterilization procedures of which um, we're going to have for what's known as an N95 mask. Um, so we have that in place so that we're now collecting N95 masks that are used, re-sterilizing those and saving them for in case there is another surge. Um, you know, that cloth mask, if it's predicted that if 60% wore the cloth mask, which is about 60% as effective as the mask, uh, mask Claudio had on, the okay. procedure mask. Um, if 60% of people wore these, um, we would bring this thing to a halt. So um, it's really remarkable how, how effective the mask is. Dr. Boynton, you don't seem like a shy person to me. <laughs> when you go to the grocery store and you see those families or guys buying a 12-pack without a mask? Have you ever tapped anybody on the shoulder? Well, that's not six feet away. Have you ever said anything to them, or do you have to bite your tongue because of your position? Well, I have to bite my tongue a lot, um, just human nature. But uh, uh, no, you know, I have, not, uh, I have not had the gumption to approach um, somebody who... Um, hasn't had the opportunity to learn how effective a mask is as yet. Um, you know, I was heartened to see the headline in the Rut uh, Rutland Herald today um, talking about Governor Scott and asking for masks. Um, I was in a, a store this morning getting a bagel and um, purposefully stayed away from three folks who uh, hadn't had the opportunity to wear a mask as yet. But I think, um, you know, as people learn, they'll do it. Um, it really, you know, it's, uh, it's a smart thing. It's an easy thing. Um, if you don't want to wear it when you're by yourself, great. Um, if you can wear it the rest of the time, wonderful. This, this might seem basic, <laughs> but can you explain again that the mask is there? Why? Okay, so a bunch of things. Number one, um, even me talking loud sends out small droplets. And that's why you moved away from me and when we started. So six feet is a, actually a number that came up in science. Um, at one point, the people thought three feet. We've now seen that the vast majority of these droplets um, that do have the potential to carry the virus will drop at about three feet. Um, the mask actually protects me when I wear my mask moderately, but it protects you a lot. Um, so, just a, a simple mask like this will decrease my ability to shed um, droplets as I talk um, by about 75%. Um, the mask that uh, Claudio has, the procedure mask, um, does that um, at a 99% level. So, wow. um, that's why we ask when you come into the hospital um, or come into the clinics, even if you're wearing a cloth mask, as long as we have a supply of the procedure mask, we may ask you to save your cloth mask in your pocket and put on a procedure mask while you're in the hospital. Um, so no, it not only protects you, but it also protects everybody around you. Um, very important concept. Can I just add one thing? As, as the hospital administrator, and you know, it's an election year, there's a lot of, you know, this is an unprecedented event. Wearing a mask or not wearing a mask is not a political statement, okay? Don't make it into one. It is, as Dr. Boynton said and as our clinicians have said, um, follow the doctors on this. This protects other people. Find other ways to make your political um, desires and needs known and, and opinions known, certainly. Um, but don't let the mask become a political statement. I think it's really important to protect other people. And as we go, we're gonna be in this for a long time, folks. And our success in reopening our state and getting back to business is gonna be how well we can work together, pull together, 
stay together and adhere to some of these guidelines that we're hearing. So I think that's really important for people to hear. Yeah, you know, I'm so glad you said that because there are people of both parties that aren't wearing masks. Uh, there are right. people of all persuasions that it bothers them. And, I, you know, as much as we really think we know what we're doing, all it takes is one little slip to wind up infecting yourself or somebody else. Can, can you guys address this? I, 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 again, I saw this other story, a doctor who happens to be a reporter for a network, he uh, thinks he's doing everything right. And even the doctors at the White House wind up in self-quarantine. Yeah. Anything, no matter how much we know, anything can happen to any one of us. Really, when you think, all it takes is one slip. Well, it does. I, um, I, not to scare this, anybody. Yeah, I mean, this virus um, is not anywhere near as, a, as infective as, say, the measles. So, you know, you happen to walk past somebody um, in a hallway, um, as long as they're not sneezing and you're not sneezing, it would be very, very rare to have any viral transmission going on um, from just that small interchange. Um, so, you know, it really is, you know, uh, we were talking about summertime gatherings. It's really getting close to each other and talking a lot. Um, there, uh, so some people are suggesting that it takes almost 15 minutes of interchange in order to transmit enough virus to somebody to cause an infection. So, um, you know, I wouldn't hang your hat on that number. Um, these are all, you know, generalities. Um, but at the same time, you know, again, a, a casual walk by somebody is, is not something that really you need to be highly concerned about. Um, the, the big gatherings or gatherings um, where people are close together, um, rabble rousing, having a lot of fun, talking loudly, those are more concerning and that's where the mass really can be a, a lot more effective. But it is super important. The reason that we jump to um, the, the procedure masks um, in our clinics is we're going to be, we're examining you. If I, I do a lot of knee and shoulder work, if I'm examining your shoulder, you know, I'm pretty near your face and you're pretty near mine. Um, we do our best. Um, I ask you to turn your head. I turn my head to the side or stand behind you in order to um, examine your shoulder, but nonetheless, um, that interchange is more than just two, two seconds or even a couple of minutes. The other thing, if I <clears throat> could also add on this is, not just the mask, if you are not feeling well, if you have a fever, you sore throat, you're coughing, you have some of these symptoms that we all know what they are now, if you're not feeling well for any reason, don't go out and don't go into work Call your health care provider and discuss your symptoms. Um, you know, and I think this is going to be really tough. Number one is we're Vermonters. We're tough people. We don't let a cold hold us down. At this point, you know, typically you wouldn't think of calling out of work if you had a cold. Call out of work if you have a cold and be, don't go in until you have a chance to get screened. Talk to your health care provider. Go over your symptoms. Uh, that is going to be really critical for us. And, and so people, again, they don't, you know, they, they want to get back to work. The other thing is people want to work and they feel they have to work economically, right? Obviously, we've been off. It's been an incredible um, stress and strain on families and our businesses. Uh, the hospital is not immune from that. Um, we've had our financial challenges. People want to go to work. All I can say is as tough as it is to miss a day of work and to do this to be safe, um, by, by infecting that, bringing that into the workplace, you know, might shut down the whole workplace. So it's really important that if you're not feeling well, um, even with cold-like symptoms that you wouldn't even think twice about, make sure you take it seriously and talk to your health care provider and stay isolated until you get clearance from them. Let me add on to that just a little bit. Um, you know, it, there's been a lot of uh, talk about fevers and people really hanging their hats on fevers as the primary uh, symptom. We now know that um, most people don't get a fever until they're well into the infection. Um, 
often several days, and that you can transmit the infection long before you get a fever. So the, although if you have a fever, that's important, um, if you don't have a fever, you could s still be um, carrying COVID-19 in a transmissible manner. So really important to, as Claudio said, pay attention to those early symptoms um, and nip this in the bud. With that in mind about getting back to work, we had a meeting with HR this morning. And uh, there's a lot of stuff that we have to do. We have to make sure everybody's on board. A lot of companies will be starting to do these things in the next few weeks as the governor loosens up some of the rules. And, you know, uh, we, you want to make sure that you have all these policies in place before you return to work, even if you only have a three-man operation. Uh, can you guys address this about going back to work and some of the things that we should be uh, careful of? And I would say especially if you have a three-person operation. So um, the, uh, um, the policies are based in science. This is not uh, Governor Scott and Dr. Levine dreaming stuff up. This is scientific um, recommendations. They're evidence-based. They make great sense. Um, the, uh, I agree with you. The, wor the worst thing you could do would be to get back in a too early of a manner um, end up uh, causing a, an outburst in your your workplace that could lead to an outburst into you know uh, somebody else in that same family may work at you know one of the um, nursing homes or somewhere like that and carries it on. So um, again, pay attention to these. And uh, I got I do want to call out the local businesses and the uh, um, the heroism of, of that, Killington closing down early, um, foregoing all of that uh, income um, and all of that fun and joy that they create um, in order to uh, help bring this pandemic to an end, really impressive. And, and seeing that through businesses throughout the entire community. And then feeding really people, cool. and then giving that food to people that yeah, need yeah. it on top of that. Yeah, remarkable. Just amazing. Yeah. yeah, you're right, that was a huge sacrifice. And our business community has, uh, really rallied. I, we, uh, I've tried, I've asked Tracy Moore, our development director, to, um, you know, I'd like to see all the uh, donations we get and personally sign thank you acknowledgments to folks because um, of their extraordinary generosity. But, you know, whether it's uh, two or three face masks that they donate that they s sewed on their own, or a lot of our businesses that are struggling on their own have donated meals and brought over pizzas and food yeah. and supplies and it's been really uh, tremendously heartening and so I want to thank everybody in our community that has reached out to us either even if you just made a sign and posted it out in front of the hospital it's been tremendously comforting and encouraging for everybody at the hospital that has been uh, here to take care of the community. I played a clip of Howie Stratton again on the radio this morning and uh, wow talk about viral Excuse me, too soon. Uh, but it just went all over the world. Yeah. I mean, some of the comments, Australia, Germany, London, everywhere. Everybody's putting up these stars saying, hello, Rutland. I mean, uh, between Nancy Greenwood and all the people that she had working, when I drive down the road in this area and I see those stars, I have to ask you gentlemen, how do you feel when you see that? Um, very touched, very touched. Um, sometimes getting up and getting to work, um, there's fears. Um, doctors, nurses, staff are not immune to those fears. Um, those stars make it worthwhile. Yeah. As a matter of fact, Dr. Boynton, uh, we drove in separate cars for social distancing, and as we were coming to come into the studio today, uh, he showed me he's got a star in the front of his car he made for one of his staff members. So, uh, nice. yeah, that's yeah. been really... Uh, been a great movement and it's been a great source of support and inspiration for us and people around the world actually yeah it's been it's been amazing thank you Howie that <laughs> that was fantastic you know uh, you mentioned if you're sick don't go into work but let's go over the basics again if you're short of breath and you're having chest pains what should you do go to the emergency room um, there's been concern um, and there's actually data that supports that there are people having emergencies 
who have been concerned about going to the emergency room um, and have suffered ill effects because they haven't gone. I don't know how much that's occurred in our community. I hope not very much, um, but I, we do have some data that suggests it's happening somewhat. Um, the emergency room is ready. It is safe. Um, it's a lot safer than staying at home with chest pain symptoms, stroke symptoms, a broken ankle. Um, the emergency room's there for you. They take all the same precautions we've been talking about. You'll be asked to go through a screen. If you do have respiratory symptoms or flu-like illness symptoms alongside that, you'll be triaged uh, or directed a, a bit different direction. So, and if you don't have those symptoms, um, uh, uh, another direction so that we keep folks safe um, and uh, maintain that physical distance that's so important. Um, but really, there is no reason not to go to the emergency department if you have a, a illness that requires emergency care. It's really important. Yeah. Uh, so don't worry about, you guys have all those procedures set up. So, you know, even if you cut your hand badly, don't be worried. About, I'm not going to go there. There's a bunch of COVID people. Don't be afraid of that stuff. Yeah, and, and here's the other thing we haven't talked about much, but, you know, obviously, you know, the, the long-term economic effects are really starting to impact all of us. And, um, you know, the hospital has financial counselors that will work with you. Don't put off coming to the hospital for care because you lost your health insurance or you lost your job and so forth. That is the mission of Rutland Regional Medical Center. We will take care of you and provide emergency treatment and care regardless of whether you have insurance or you don't have insurance. Don't let that prevent you from coming to get care. Um, so we will work with you. Our financial counselors will work with you. Um, and please do come in. Uh, and I know that's hard for Vermonters who are proud people and so forth. But listen, this is an unprecedented situation. We will help work with you to get you through this. We talked about physical ailments, and you're kind of touching upon my next question. Anxiety, depression, we have a lot of people that are staying home looking at four walls. They're facing financial hardships. They're, they're becoming uh, teachers for their kids, homeschooling. They have all this pressure. What about counseling? Is, uh, what do we do if somebody really needs to reach out and ask for help? So there's a lot of different, uh, um, and it's a really good um, point, um, but there's a lot, of, a lot of different ways. I mean, number one, um, seek, seek help through um, those you trust. If you don't have access to a counselor, you haven't had the, need, the opportunity to need one previously, start with your primary care provider, um, and they know you best, you know them best, they can help guide you. Um, those fears are real, and they, uh, the, um, you know, they're, you know, you're not alone if you're having those. It's, uh, it's something that's real. It's something that we're working to obviate. Um, it is some, but, uh, but seek help and seek care for that. It, um, you, again, you're not alone. You know, I, I was talking with my uh, primary physician the other day, and he said that he's doing a lot more. Uh, conferencing on the computer, uh, telepracticing. Do you guys find that that's happening a lot more? Yes, so um, we would call that a video visit. So within the world of telehealth, there's telephone visits, there's video visits, or there's teleconferencing perhaps with a, a specialist between a couple of different physicians. But um, the video visits um, are remarkable in how useful they are. Um, they are something that we're ramping up quickly. They're available throughout our clinics right now. Um, they're available through the primary care providers in town right now. And uh, they're, they're convenient. Um, they're effective. Um, if there is um, something that comes up during the video visit that would require a physical examination um, or laboratory test, then you'll be directed to uh, how to make that happen. Um, but uh, yeah, the technology is wonderful. Um, I think most of us have probably had Zoom conferences with our families or with grandma who's down in Florida, what have you. Um, well, we can use the same thing in healthcare and uh, um, get a great understanding of uh, what we can do to help each other.
Claudio, uh, I know that uh, you mentioned uh, that you had a lot of people that you had to furlough or lay off. Are we calling some of those people back already? Yeah, actually quite a few, especially over the past couple weeks. As we've, um, as I said last Friday, we started doing elective uh, surgical procedures. And um, so a lot of the people that we called off were people in kind of the, what we would call back office functions. Those people that when Dr. Boynton says it's time for you to have a surgery or he orders an MRI for you, um, before you come in for the MRI, there's one of our staff that's calling your insurance company to get pre-authorization to make sure that they'll pay for that um, so you don't get stuck with a huge bill. Then there's people in uh, Dr. Boynton's office and in the hospital that schedule the actual surgical procedure and so forth. So a lot of those people we've been bringing back. So we had about 150 at the peak that we furloughed. Uh, I think we're down to probably about 50 people now that are still out on furlough and we're still starting, you know, every day we're, we're getting requests and we're bringing some of them back. Now, that said, um, you know, we don't, there's no guarantee we're gonna be able to bring every, everybody back. As a matter of fact, uh, you know, we're back looking at the hospital's budget, which needs to be submitted over the summer. And we're really working on the challenges that we're facing with the economics of this on the hospital. And how do we continue to provide the services and, and the full services our community expects and we pro provided um, with some of the financial challenges we've, we've faced and will continue to face with the COVID crisis. And certainly uh, as a business, you're not alone. Anybody that's listening today that works at a business or you own a business, if you're watching PEG TV today and you're, you're furloughed or you own a business that's not open yet, almost everyone can identify with what we're going through. Certainly uh, at the radio station, we can identify with this as well. Uh, we had, I mentioned uh, at the beginning of the show that uh, we had some great questions uh, last time. So if I can just ask you a couple of basic ones, and I think they're worth repeating, and I got a kick out of this one. Is there a special soap that you guys use? Is there a better soap than any other soap? And is soap better than hand sanitizer, or is it the other way around? So um, most soaps um, are perfect for this virus. So there are things called antibacterial soap. This is not a bacteria, this is a virus. Um, the, the soap will um, help to degrade the virus and kill it, um, no matter what particular brand you're using. A big part of washing your hands is the vigor with which you wash your hands as well and the time. So that 20 second number is legitimate. I tend to go well over that, um, but um, that uh, scrubbing your hands with any type of soap will, will actually do the job for you. Warm water to hot water is excellent as well. Coming from someone who's uh, trained probably day one in, in medical school on the job as a surgeon on how to wash his hands and scrub into surgery, we should have we brought a sink and had you do a little demonstration, <laughs> Dr. Boynton. Uh, you know, uh, we started out in my family, we were so strict. We, we would put the groceries in the garage. Anything that didn't have to be refrigerated sat there for 48 hours. Now, if I know there's a bag of chips out there, <laughs> I got to go get a, you know, a wipe and wipe down the bag of chips because I can't wait 48 hours. I am not the poster child for self-discipline. How, how do we stay motivated? I mean, when we, we went, went out to get the mail, we would wear a mask to get the mail because we knew that there could be germs on the mail. We know that if you get a package from Amazon, that it can live on uh, cardboard for like, what, 42 hours or 72 hours now? And you think about that, and you see all these people shopping on Amazon because they can't shop as much locally as, and yet every package that I get, it started out at 72, now it's 48. Now, hey, or, uh, something is here, oh, let's rip it open. How do we stay focused and disciplined? So I don't, want to burst your bubble, but I think that um, you may be overdoing it with uh, every single one of those things. <laughs> Nobody's it's ever accused hours. me of being overdoing um, it. I would, uh, I would, you know, surfaces that you can keep clean and you can wipe down, 
please do. I personally don't leave my Amazon packages on my front step for three days. Um, we go ahead and open those up and wash our hands afterwards and not touch our face as we've opened the package. Um, the, uh, the science shows less than 6% of the transmissions have come from surface, you know, surface to hand to mouth or face. So pretty low risk there, but you know, put your groceries away, wipe things down, put them away, wash your hands, um, stay six feet apart in the grocery store. Um, I think that common sense is going to get you there the vast majority of the way. You know, um, wow. So those <laughs> chip, those chips sat there an extra twelve hours. <laughs> <laughs> In my garage, the squirrels would have gotten to the chips. So. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that um, the biggest challenge, and I, and I, and we all, there's not anybody that's immune to this. There's not anyone in the world that's immune to this. And how do we stay focused? How do we keep deciding to wear that mask every day? How do you tell your teenager that, yeah, you do have to wash your hands that much or that you can't sneak off and see your girlfriend uh, because it's not just your girlfriend, it's where's your girlfriend's brother been and, you know, that whole chain of things that you have to, the tracing, uh, it's, it's crazy. It's, it's the new normal, Terry. I think that's what we talk about at the hospital is how do we now get back to delivering our care in the new normal? And, you know, the governor's order, uh, his emergency order to stay at home order, um, it, we'll see tomorrow it expires. We'll see what he says and what his decisions are on that. But there's nothing magical about May 15th that uh, tomorrow that isn't going to be here today, that's not going to be here on June 15th or July 15th, or until we ultimately get a vaccine for this, um, or it runs its course through creating herd immunity. So this is a long-term um, challenge that we've got, and we are not used to that. We're used to quick gratification. You know, it's only been a couple of months, and we're you know, a lot of us are at the end of our rope, and rightly so, but we've got to find a way to create the discipline and the new routines that incorporate this. And we will, because we're resourceful and we'll figure this out. I've already seen some incredible ideas and some things happen. Um, but unfortunately, there's no quick way out of this. There's no easy solution and there's no quick way that we're going to all of a sudden recover overnight. It's going to be a long haul and we just need, especially as Vermonters, and I think in Vermont we have a, a better chance of doing this because I think we are closer. We are um, less susceptible to kind of the glitz and the glamour and the high-paced things. So I think working together, you know, having some kindness. Uh, Dr. Boynton told us early on in, in this as we started dealing with this situation is, Recognize that people are acting from a place of good intentions. So assume good intentions, um, even though it might not come off at that. And I think that's really a couple times I've really checked myself and said, you know what, we're all trying to do the same thing. We're all trying to do the right thing and figure out our way through this together. Um, so, you know, have a little patience with each other. So it's unfortunately, it's going to be a long haul, but we will get there. You know, I, I find myself playing that song, Hands, by Jewel, and she repeat, repeats this refrain over and over again that only kindness matters. And I thought of that again as you, you just said that, or we're coming from a place of good intention. And, of course, hands, well, you've got to wash them. Uh, Dr. Boynton, any uh, final remarks for you today? Um, if you have symptoms, seek care. You'll get tested. Um, when we first uh, started dealing with this, um, you had to have been on a cruise ship, coughed on, fever 104, um, all sorts of uh, traveled in Wuhan, China in order to qualify for a test. Um, if you have even mild symptoms now of a cold, and I get it can be allergy season and that can mimic a cold, Get tested. The tests we have, plenty of testing capacity. Um, the testing is effective. Um, it's accurate. 
Um, that, that will really help bring this to a close. The State Department of Health has started a contact tracing program, so if you do happen to be positive, you, they're going to reach out to you. And again, they will help you to be a hero, to bring it to an end within your world, which is all of our worlds. Uh, with that in mind, uh, are you guys connected? Are you, are, is RRMC just out there by itself, or are we sharing information with everybody else? I mean, you're reaching out. So, um, in terms of uh, clinical information um, that is not patient specific and new treatments or new cares, that th we're reaching out constantly, back and forth, everybody learning from each other's experience. Um, in terms of public health and, and helping to the contact tracing, that is not really the hospital's job. We, we cooperate with the Vermont Department of Health, but it really is the Vermont Department of Health and their program that helps to bring the, the outbreaks to an end. Yeah, you know, uh, um, and also Rutland Regional is an independent community hospital. We're not part of a system, but we are well connected in Vermont. Um, the, uh, Dr. Brumstead and the folks at UVM have invited me to participate in their system calls on their response to this. Dr. Boynton uh, meets on a regular basis with the other hospital chief medical officers to talk about um, the total Vermont hospital response and to give advice and guidance and feedback to the Department of Health and the Department of the Agency of Human Services and uh, the folks from Dartmouth. We've got close uh, connections both clinically through Dr. Boynton and administratively and we've been in contact with uh, our colleagues across the river in New Hampshire. So we are pretty well connected and we've stayed well connected. This is, um, you know, we're all going through this together. Claudia, the, the last uh, word is yours. Uh, CEO and uh, president of RRMC, Claudio Fort. Uh, any final message for folks? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, <clears throat> uh, it's kind of you going through stages with this and it's almost like a grieving process. And one of the things that's really hit me uh, currently as we're in May is, you know, this is, we're getting into graduation uh, season. So for those college seniors and for those high school seniors, um, it's tragic. And there's some grieving that goes along with that. And I feel for you having um, a daughter who graduated from college uh, last year, fortunately. Um, for those of you who are graduating this year, you're missing out on a lot of that, uh, all that celebration that leads up to that incredible accomplishment. And your senior year of high school, um, the time that's made for proms and spring track and all that type of stuff. It's been, it's been really challenging. Um, and I, I think just recognize that um, it's okay to grieve a little bit over this and it's gonna be tough. Um, and uh, there's still a long road ahead of us. Um, you know, this is uncertain and we're still learning about this. I think the only message that I have uh, today for our community and I know Rutland will do this and Rutland County can do this better than a lot of places is we gotta stick together, we gotta be patient, we have to assume good intentions and continue to work together. There's some challenges, incredible, unprecedented challenges and, and um, tragedies that people are going through and the businesses are, are challenging an, an uncertain future. Um, we will stick together and we will continue to get through this and I think we, as much as we can grieve and loss and give us the chance to do that, we also need to look on the bright side. It could have been much worse. We've gotten through the worst part of this. We've got a long road ahead. If we continue to do what we've done to, br to bring us this far, we will fare okay on this and we will get through this. So thank you again. Thank you to PEG TV and Catamount Radio. Thanks for the opportunity to, to bring this message out to the community and connect and let them know what's going on at, at our hospital and medical center. For Rutland Regional Medical Center Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Mel Boyton and CEO and President of RRMC, Claudio Fort, I'm Terry J. Stay safe. <laughs>